by way of introduction. I think I know many of you. I'm Jeremy Utley. I'm a Perry. company, Harry Claybon, and then our amazing team, Catherine Segovia and Zhao are in the background making everything happen as well. Um, so welcome to the Masters of Creativity series session one. Uh, let's see, I'll kick it off. I'm going to try to share my screen and Perry, just let me know if it actually works. Okay. Well, the good news is if you want to follow along I, I, in chat, I dropped in the deck, you can download it. So if, if that's easier for you and you want to do it that way, or you want to grab our materials, you know, please do. Yeah. If you, if, you know, we're, uh, Perry's the kind of guy, if you ever sit by Perry on an airplane, he's fast forwarding through most movies. So yeah, yeah, go to the end. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to fast forward through this talk, you can actually download the slides at this link and you can you can go at your own speed. Unfortunately, you can't get us to talk faster, but you can at least take a sneak peek and look ahead. But uh, we're excited to uh, to be with you all today. I want to start for those of you who we don't know. We want to tell you a little bit about where we're coming from and what led us actually to want to host this talk series. Awesome. So. A little bit of our background, we have so many interesting past uh, students um, of many different classes here. So these, you've probably come through one of these windows here. Um, so uh, if you think about the work we do with students at Stanford, um, along with Catherine, who run this program, Leading Disruptive Innovation, there's a few of you um, past students there. We call it D Leadership um, is the class. And it's a, it's a class that we actually put students into organizations um, to lead change efforts using design tools. Um, and it can be a lot of fun and, and uh, pretty wild. And then the other one is um, Launchpad, which um, is a, an accelerator using design methods to launch businesses, for-profits, non-profits. It's been around 11 years. Um, uh, so many companies, but visit the website and take a look at that if you're interested. And there's lots of sort of interesting tools and techniques related to um, the early work there. I see a few of the founders, uh, even from this year in the, in the group today, so welcome. And then with executives and professionals, we do um, boot camps or other types of programs that are intense programs that happen at Stanford or online um, that are um, synchronous and um, involve Catherine is a big part of that. Jow is a big part of that. We put on these huge efforts and we just uh, just did one um, a few weeks ago. And then Stan Stanford Online, which I think there's many of you here that came through the SIME program, um, which is a program we'd invite you to look at that, that goes through all the tools and techniques of design as well as leading design um, that's available at Stanford Online. So welcome. I think everybody came through one of those windows most likely. I'm going to try to hit the eraser here. I don't know if that how that works. Boom! Look at that. Nailed it. Buck, welcome from SINE. Good to have you with us. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so Perry just shared a little bit of the various windows that folks might be coming through. One of the things that we have been curious about is what are the tools that folks lean on? And increasingly, we're finding that some of the tools and some of the entryway points that we have established at, through executive education and other programs at the D School are getting a little worn. You might notice the hexagons are starting to look a little tired. And we think less and less in terms of this kind of hexagon driven, uh, uh, re uh, formulaic recipe driven approach. If you, think, if you think back to where Perry and I, what Perry and I looked like when we started with the hexagons, <laughs> we, were, we were barely out of high school practically, okay? A lot has changed. I oh, got yeah. Surgery. I've been through multiple pairs of glasses and major surgery for crying out loud. Well, and also that that photo of you, Jeremy, I still think just maybe audience vote. How much does he look like George Costanza with the vest on? I think I think personally a lot. It's the Costanza photo. Please <laughs> drop, drop it in chat. If there's any other crazy characters, drop it in chat. But one of the things that we have observed as we've been doing this work inside organizations and with graduate students is there's this focus on the sprint. And by the way, we, we value the sprint quite a bit. Uh, the idea of a short burst of high intensity work. If you're coming from Launchpad, you know we value the sprint. We're often getting folks to sprint, but we find that, that basically reducing the, the design thinking driven approach to a sprint is like telling somebody who needs to come up with ideas, uh, especially good ideas, the ideas they can implement and commercialize. It's like saying, just grab a couple ideas from the grocery store on your way home with the jug of milk and with the, you know, with the bunch of kale, pick up a couple ideas too. 
And increasingly, as we're immersed in organizations, as we're connected with you all as our alums, we're finding it's not really how innovation works and it's not really how creativity works. Creativity, if we have to think about a different metaphor from the grocery store, it's more like a garden and you're cultivating a set of behaviors and attitudes and practices and mindsets. And there's a lot more attention on a daily basis, less in terms of sprinting and more in terms of what we would think of as practice. And if you like the sprint metaphor, then you might think about the daily activities as stretching and as training and as warming up. Sprinting is great. It's very important. We love it. But unless your life is marked by a set of warm ups and stretches and practices, you're probably going to pull a hammy if you start sprinting. right? And you've probably seen that in the context of your work. It's just like drop and give me a 400. You go uh, right now, like I haven't even stretched, right? A lot of times creative action and innovation efforts are kind of reduced down to that start sprinting now immediately go and it doesn't have respect for the system that a creative mind lives in and what the practices and attitudes to cultivate that creative mindset actually are so we kind of want to take a step back from design practice and even from innovation itself and talk about the, the system and the uh, environmental factors that enable creativity, individual and team creativity to flourish. So establishing our sort of premise for this series is that creativity is a craft and you hone it through practice. Then that, what does that make us, Jeremy? Well, it makes us kind of like personal trainers. So uh, we'll date ourselves a little bit here with Saturday Night Live, Fonz and Franz to pump you up. Um, uh, it's hysterical. If you don't know what we're talking about, Google Hans and Franz Saturday Night Live, Dana Carvey. It is hysterical. Um, anyway, so, but the idea is thinking about personal trainers work directly with you and sort of almost find a way for these tools and techniques to, to fit into your life. And that's what we think of these sessions as not what Jeremy said, like this perfect project. And I'm going to use all these tools. But actually, really, um, we, we hope you see today discrete techniques that work against all kinds of different things in your life, whether group activities or individual activities, personal life, professional life, um, that you can apply directly. So the series itself, um, we're going to be doing four, uh, four different sessions. Um, you are in the input obsession um, session. Uh, we'll cover collaboration, experimentation, and updating your creative operating system. Uh, to trademark, you know, us today because we just came up with that before this talk. Um, but the the whole idea is really sort of circling around this idea of practice, and these would be different lenses, different sort of categories of techniques um, to build your practice around creativity. So part of the part of the fundamental um, myth is that creativity is about output. We mentioned this in kind of our correspondence um, leading into this uh, session. Most folks, when they think about creativity, they think about a creative outcome. And that's not the way to think about creativity. Uh, Arthur, Arthur Kostler uh, did some research in the mid 1960s. And this is one of my favorite definitions. Creativity is the collision of apparently unrelated frames of reference. And you can think about one frame is your brain today, a different frame is your brain tomorrow, et cetera. But what you're colliding your brain with, it, the outcomes of those collisions are creative outcomes. But instead of thinking about creativity being the output of your effort, what we would recommend is saying creativity is actually a function of the inputs you're feeding the system. And what we've observed among highly successful and creative in individuals is that they are relentless and focused and rigorous about cultivating inputs of mind in order to lead to creative outputs. So a lot of us who are not experienced creatives or, or we don't come from creative fields, when we hear about creativity, we think about drawing or we think about the arts or we think about um, some kind of outcome that looks beautiful. And what we know actually from immersing in organizations and, and immersing with creative professionals is that creatives are way more concerned with their inputs. As an example, my wife's a fashion designer and she goes on these inspiration trips to New York and Paris. I, I think it's because she likes macarons, but the truth is she's, she's looking at color, she's looking at silhouette, she's looking at form. She comes and she makes these inspo boards 
you know, and I remember as an MBA when she was making inspo boards, I'm going, what are you doing? What is the purpose of that? Like that, I can't put that in a spreadsheet. I can't run a pivot table on the inspiration board. And I love maybe, maybe a two by two. It's hard to fit an inspiration board into a two by two, right? And yet, as I watch her, I see that's what's fueling her craft. I had the opportunity to teach a class with a hip hop artist called uh, Lecrae last fall. And our teaching team was giving our students an assignment where we were telling them, uh, you need to go out and get inspiration. You've got this problem, but before you try to solve it, get inspired. And I could see the blank stares on our students' faces and I could sympathize. As a, as a former MBA, I could see that creativity is not even, or sorry, inspiration isn't even a topic on the radar, let alone you know, anything worth doing. And I just turned to Lecrae and I said, Lecrae, how do you think about inspiration? I mean, he's won multiple Grammys. He's a you know, wildly productive, prolific entrepreneur and artist. And I love what he said. He just said, inspiration's a discipline. And to me, it stood in such stark contrast to how our students that we were, we were trying to exhort to go get inspiration thought about that topic. I think for most people, if you think about this topic of inspiration, you think about the cheesy poster in the corporate hallway. It's like motivation or teamwork and that's inspiration. That's not, when we're talking about inspiration and the discipline of inspiration, we're not talking about plastering the hallways mm -hmm. with cheesy posters. That's not what we mean by this word. So we want to try to redeem the word and give it a new definition. Yeah, you're, you're, otherwise you're not in the dentist's office. That's where I see those posters. They always remind me of the dentist's office, the waiting room. Um, anyway, so if you want to point, Jeremy, this is, this is the point. You want to point to the side, Jeremy. There we go. Screen grab. Okay, that's funny. Um, if this, you, so if, you're, if you want to, um, the premise of kind of what we're going to talk about here is in different ways, it's you're pursuing unexpected inputs. And if you're going through your day pursuing these unexpected inputs and leaving yourself open for them, that's the, that's the creative practice we want to help you hone as we pump you up today. Um, pump you and, up. Yeah, but, with... and it's really and unexpected is actually an important word before Perry pumps you up because that's how imag imagination is stimulated. Imagination is stimulated by surprising inputs. And the, and the real, I, I read a research report, I know I'm a nerd, but I do that. And it, it, it pictured an organization like a sphere. And it says the vast majority of the organization has no contact with the outside world, only the surface does. But that's the only part of the organization that's likely to come in contact with an unexpected input. Yeah. And I like that as a metaphor, that if you want to stimulate your imagination, you're not, you need to seek out, you need to be deliberate about finding things you don't already know. And it requires a trip to, or a short circuit of, the tendencies in much of organizational life, which is around reinforcing what we do already know, and doubling down, and, and, and going in things that we've already uh, thought about, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, Perry, I interrupted your, your pump up moment. That's all right. It's kind of, I can't do it now. That'd be weird. So let's just move on. You want to you wanna restart? Should we restart? <laughs> Maybe the next slide, please. <laughs> All right. So we'll break down these tools into uh, ways of creating connections. And it reminds me just briefly, there's a, there's a great lecturer, a professor at uh, Stanford, Robert Sapolsky, wrote a book called Behave. It's amazing. And uh, I think the team or, or myself, I can't remember, we had a meeting with him and he he talked about sort of um, new ideas coming from, he's a neuroscience and, and primatologist and all these things, but talked about the, the act of a new idea is a lot of times just clashing together, you know, two things you haven't clashed together before. So Jeremy's point about something unexpected coming together with maybe another problem you're trying to solve creates a bunch of new connections that just yield new ideas, things that are new to you. So that's the, that's the idea. We're going to cover um, two techniques um, in this category. Or three techniques, bonus technique. Bonus this is technique. real time, people. This is, this is happening right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to throw Perry off. So I'm changing the slides in the background real time. He has the slide deck. I have a copy that's now out of date. So I'm like the old operating system now. Let's that's talk about funny. analogies first. So analogies, well, you go ahead, Jeremy, and run it, but without much setup. So we want to we want to actually do a, like this nerdy thing where you read the screen. Um, this is a this is an insight related problem. Uh, that if it's called actually there's an official title of it. It's called Dunker's radiation problem, 
You might be familiar with it if you're familiar with obscure 1930s research. It was written about in a couple of recent books. And we, when we stumbled across it, we just thought it was such a good example of should the we challenge. To, well, should we have Catherine do a voiceover without the camera on? Then it's really interactive. Oh, Catherine, like you want movie. to? Yeah, I, yeah. I love Catherine, it. Catherine, you ready? She's got, a, she's, she's got the radio voice. Let's hear it, Catherine. Yep. Suppose you are a doctor faced with a patient who has a malignant stomach tumor. It is impossible to operate on this patient, but unless the tumor is destroyed, the patient will die. There is a kind of ray that can be used to destroy the tumor. If the rays reach the tumor all at once in a sufficiently high intensity, the tumor will be destroyed. Unfortunately, at this intensity, the healthy tissue that the rays pass through on the way to the tumor will also be destroyed. At lower intensities, the rays are harmless to healthy tissue, but they will not affect the tumor either. What type of procedure might be used to destroy the tumor with the rays and at the same time avoid destroying the healthy tissue? It's on you to, exercise, to excise the tumor and save the patient, but the rays are either too powerful or too weak. How can you solve it? So you're thinking about this problem. This is actually, think about it for a moment. Don't be concerned if you can't solve it. Only about 10% of people solve it initially. Again, these are people from the 1930s. Probably it's different in the 2020s. Probably, <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but uh, radio <laughs> operator, would you, mind, would you mind to continue? While you're thinking, a little story to pass the time. There once was a general who needed to capture a fortress in the middle of a country from a brutal dictator. If the general could get all of his troops to the fortress at the same time, they would have no problem taking it. Plenty of roads that the troops could travel radiated out from the fort like spoke wheels, but they were strewn with mines. So only small groups of soldiers could safely traverse any one road. The general came up with a plan he divided the army into small groups and each group traveled a different road leading to the fortress. They synchronized their watches and made sure to converge on the fortress at the same time via their separate roads. The plan worked. The general captured the fortress and overthrew the dictator. Have you saved the patient yet? Just one last story while you're still thinking. Years ago, a small town fire chief arrived, <laughs> let me put that in the right order, <laughs> a small town fire chief arrived at a woodshed fire, concerned that it would spread to a nearby house if it was not extinguished quickly. There were no hydrants nearby, but the shed was next to a lake, so there was plenty of water. Dozens of neighbors were already taking turns with buckets, throwing water on the shed, but they weren't making any progress. The neighbors were surprised when the fire chief yelled at them to stop and to all go fill their buckets in the lake. When they returned, the chief arranged them in a circle around the shed and on the count of three had them all throw their water at once. The fire was immediately dampened and soon thereafter extinguished. The town gave the fire chief a pay raise as a reward for quick thinking. Can we, can we, uh, on, so we're all looking at each other. Let's give Catherine some fireworks applause for that reading. I mean, that was, that was just marvelous. Thank you, It's story Catherine. time for executives. <laughs> story time, exactly. You're like, man, there really is no fast forward button? No. Uh, but so, so what's interesting is, yeah, some of you are getting it in the chat now, which is great. Um, the interesting thing is the, is the data here. Only about 10% of people solve the problem initially. Um, if, if they hear both of the, uh, the problem and the fortress story, about 30% solve the, the problem. If they hear both and the fire chief story, half solve it. And then if they're given those and told to use them to help solve the radiation problem, 80% sol uh, solve the problem. What does this tell us? It tells us that you have to have a mindset of looking to apply an analogy. There are rich learnings in other fields, but they only yield themselves up to you if you're looking. And if you're having the attitude of, I almost think about it as having the attitude of, I'm going to force a fit. What if I assume for a moment that there must be a connection between this analogous situation and the problem I'm trying to solve? 
What might I learn from it? And a lot of times trying on that forcible collision, to use Kostler's word, trying on the collision yields unexpected insights and possibilities that even inter that wouldn't have come to me if I hadn't been willing to entertain it. But we've seen it. This isn't just a research phenomenon. We've actually seen this in practice in many organizations, and it's a highly effective strategy. Oh, Jeremy, I'm going to tell the story in a second, but I'm also going to put Jeremy's blog link in there if you want to learn more. Also, it just Jeremy needs a couple ad dollars there. So, <laughs> go ahead. I'm I don't run ads. Spike in but, traffic. But, but you're giving me thing. an idea. I should set that up next time. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Anyway, so for um, a bunch of you who came through SINE, this is a this is a story we tell in that. So this will be a review for you, uh, new to others. Um, we we had the pleasure of working with a, a team out of um, Fairchild Semiconductor many many years ago, and used a technique using analogy and timely because you've been reading about these headlines where there's shortages of um, semiconductors. Well, the challenge they had was that um, small, small customers would get shorted on their orders and cause major, major challenges. At that point, for example, Tesla was actually a small customer. Many of the car companies are technically small customers because they're using one or two you know, chips from a supplier per car. But imagine if they don't have it, you're seeing what's happening. They can't even you know, build a whole car. Um, so anyway, they had this challenge of, of um, interruptions in supply affecting um, smaller customers radically. And they sought to understand and use analogy to, to drive new ideas. And they thought for, so what they did is they, they went into the world with this problem and said, okay, where are places we can learn um, about um, businesses or people that deal with routine interruptions, um, but manage to still supply their customers? And one of the places they met, it's a great story, they still tell us about going to a florist and saying, how in the world do you promise somebody flowers two weeks from now when they're perishable, you know, you might have a big, you know, order come in the day before, like how in the world do you deal with that? And the florists explained, we have relationships with farmers and we sort of see what they're farming and what's potentially going to be in. And we, we sort of work with that um, to manage expectations of our customers in advance. And they took that back and they used that as sort of an input to their design process and ultimately launched a um, supplier. It's called DigiKey. Um, it's on the internet, but it's a it's a different kind of uh, supply uh, portal for their customers that allows them to see production coming from Fairchild, but also to see suppliers from other vendors even. So they could they realize what they want to do with those smaller customers is make sure they, like the florist, they have a perspective as to what's going to be available and what might not be available. So a good example of like uh, going out in the world and seeking these unexpected inputs. And by being open, they suddenly noticed, well, we can learn a lot from a florist and use that an analog, like the problem Jeremy just went through, to drive their thinking and get to new places they wouldn't have got to before. Yeah, it's, I, I remember distinctly the team coming back. They were very skeptical when we said, <laughs> no, go to a massage, go to a nail salon, go to a sushi bar. And they're like, you're kidding, right? But yeah. they came back, the teams came back super energized. Catherine was there, remembers as well. They were super energized because they're learning from a florist, meaningful insights about supply chain management. And when you abstract a level, you say, yeah, actually it's not an unfamiliar challenge. And the fact that it's unfamiliar in your industry doesn't mean that it's unfamiliar to the world. And a lot of times if you're thoughtful about, and if you've taken the uh, innovation strategy course in the SINE certificate, you probably know this method intimately because we walk through it step by step, but the world will yield up lots of amazing insights to the person who's looking. There's a little bit of research that we've done on analogy that I just figured I'd mention here, but an analogy uh, empirically speaking leads to more output than a generic prompt, that's one level. Second level is multiple analogies generate more output than a single analogy does. And then the third level is the more distant the analogy, the more generative it is. So you might think you gotta stay close mm -hmm. in or stay focused. And actually a lot of this cultivating inputs is about entertaining the possibility of a collision with something highly unrelated or highly distant. Yeah. Yeah, and you think about those executive teams, they're saying, well, no, 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 I want to benchmark. I want to look at what our competitors are doing. But by going, this, this is critical, like I, get, I like that point, Jeremy, by going beyond to a florist that has nothing whatever to do with our business, that's where the big idea came from. Yeah. So, uh, um, and then, so again, we're in this, this sort of driving connection. Um, this idea of a wonder wander is something that we now assign routinely in our classes. Um, 
Jeremy and I are known to do this also on a, on a daily basis. And they, the basic idea is if you have a clear sort of frame on a problem, a, a clear thing you're working on, one of the best things you can do is actually step away. So right now, if I said, how do I make this talk more interesting? The best thing I could do is walk outside with just the idea of how do I make that more interesting, ruminate, go for a walk, and I, by holding that in my head that I'm, I'm trying to be more interesting, I might see a couple dogs playing, I might get inspiration from the outside world and just drive more inputs. It's, it's important you go out with an objective and then I would bring something with me. We'll talk about this at the end, but I'd bring a pad of post-its or a notebook to write these things down. And, and I, I would sort of come back and be able to um, have more material with which to innovate. You know, this unrelented sort of pursuit, I'd have new inputs to my practice to get inspired. Jeremy does this. We, we oftentimes have, are working on something. We'll say, okay, let's both step away, but, but hold each other accountable. Like we're gonna go work on this frame. Jeremy, truth be told, does live close to a McDonald's that does, or a, a Jack in the Box. That's right. I'm gonna say, I, I find, I find that- Jack has a lot of milkshakes. But um, anyway, that's one little bonus to this effort, I would say. Um, the viscosity of the milkshake, just the effort required, just the pure mechanical effort. It just, it's like, it sucks ideas into my head. I mean, it's yeah. really, it's truly and incredible. As you wonder that, the key thing is writing it down. And we'll get back to that at the end. So we said that we were going to cover a third topic on how do you, how do you accelerate connections? Oh, this is the bonus a, topic. I love it. The bonus topic, but wait, Perry, it's actually not a bonus topic because we realized there's so much interest in these topics. We said, let's make it its own talk next time. So oh, there's this is, a, a, this is a teaser. So sign up now. Yeah, exactly. Sign up now. Forty nine ninety nine. You will get, and you'll get a free gift with purchase. Now we we want to the, the the topic of collaboration terrible. and diverse perspectives and leveraging and amplifying diverse perspectives. It's such a worthy topic. It's actually an entirely other session on its own. And we've learned a ton from amazing leadership teams and and design teams and innovation teams and creatives that we've worked with. We just want to dedicate an entire talk to that. So it is a little bit of a teaser, but I would say. There's so many rich stories. It's it's not worth giving it a one minute treatment. It's worth giving it a, a significant uh, treatment. So we talked about connection, but now we want to talk about something that's unexpected for folks. If you think about input obsession, disconnection. Disconnection is actually a critical part of realizing new connections. Have you ever had this experience? I've had, I feel like I'm living in you know Groundhog Day these days, where I get to the end of a meeting. And there's like five things that I really need to attend to. And then immediately somebody else is on my screen in the next meeting. And I totally forget all of the other things that I was just thinking about. There's great <laughs> ideas. There's stuff I need to take care of. Right. And then, and then that meeting culminates in a bunch of other things that then immediately get forgotten. Right. Without disconnection, we don't harvest the possibility of the connections that we've been seeking. And part of when we talk about being obsessed with inputs, part of what is required is that creative thinkers and innovators make space to make the connections that happen in their minds and not rush from thing to thing to thing to thing. It's really, really hard to do this, but we find it's absolutely critical to make the space to realize connections. Our, our brains aren't efficient. They're efficient in a lot of ways. You know, you, we can't power a brain size network or, or a brain powered network with basically all the power we have available at our disposal. So they're incredibly efficient in some sense, but they're actually driven by and unexpected connections are driven by an inefficient process that oftentimes happens at a subconscious level. And as we're hyper efficiency oriented, driven from productivity, you know, meeting to meeting to meeting, we fail to maximize those connections. One of our favorite, uh, uh, researchers, Amos Tursky, who is the partner, the research partner of Danny Kahneman. If he had lived, he would have been the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Danny Kahneman. But they invented the field of behavioral psychology and behavioral economics. The, the notion that people aren't rational is we have, uh, among others, we have these two incredible, uh, incredibly brilliant gentlemen to thank. And one time, they, they devised 
a bunch of incredibly insightful and creative experiments. Part of their breakthroughs was because their experimental design was so creative. You can read about this. Mike Lewis, uh, the author of The Big Short and Moneyball, he wrote a great book on them called The Undoing Project, if you're curious about where this psychology comes from. But when somebody asked Chersky once, how did you and Kahneman come up with so many cool experiments? This is what he said. We wasted time. And he said, people waste years by not being able to waste hours. And, what, and the joke around their department, uh, they, they were uh, at a university in Israel, the joke around their department is those guys are laughing too much. It wasn't a joke. It was more of a comment of derision. They're always laughing. They're always cutting up. And yet what they knew was that a little bit of loose time was critical for them to realize the value of new connections. And so I want to talk for a second about a little bit of the dorky side of psychology. So if you read the literature, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to parse it. So this isn't meant to be a comprehensive or perfect explanation. But if you think about what's happening in the creative uh, mindset, there's a stage of preparation. There's a stage of incubation. There's a stage of illumination, which is the aha moment, right? And then there's a stage of verification. What we have observed casually, this isn't a, this isn't a clinical diagnosis because I'm not, a clin I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I would say one of the most short-circuited processes in the 21st century is incubation, giving our brain the soup space to connect things. And so when we talk about not just connection, but disconnection, part of the, part of the underlying idea there is that disconnection is actually part of what fuels connection. And if we're not deliberate about disconnecting, we won't be able to realize those new connections. So we want to talk so about- Or oftentimes we do it by accident and we think, oh, this is just magical. This happened, this illuminating moment just happened in this other context. I went out with my kids and I did something and I just suddenly, boom. But it's, we would, this is so interesting, Jeremy, that I think if you look at the preparation and incubation, that's maybe, you know, I don't know, another talk, boom, bonus Okay. Talk. And fifth in the Masters of Creativity series, Perry Claibon on preparation. Uh, Catherine, how's my voice there? Is that okay? I'm not, I'm no Catherine Segovia. Very, very radio. Thank you, very radio. Yeah. So I want to talk about three very cool tactics that we've observed in the lives of prolific innovators, discoverers, scientists. These are almost too crazy to be true. I kid you not. So I'm excited. So again, how do you get to disconnection? So the first is what we have affectionately called the divergent diversion. And this was a tactic that we stumbled upon in reading Walter Isaacson's biography of Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein's wife and son both have a shared experience of Einstein. Many times he'd be sitting frantically writing at his journal, working on equations, and then he would get frustrated. He would pace in his, he had a little, you know, chamber in the upstairs of their house. He'd be pacing around. And you know what he did? Whenever he got really stuck on a problem, he picked up his violin and he started playing the violin. And his son tells a story of many times he would hear the violin clatter and his dad go, I've got it. And he'd go rush back to the notebook, right? But to me, what's awesome is about this example is Einstein didn't do it for relaxation necessarily. He wielded the violin as a creative tool. When he was stuck, he knew that a meaningful way to advance on the problem was to think about something else or to engage a different part of his consciousness. And I love that image, but that he's not the only person who did things like this. There's another incredible innovator. I don't know, is anyone familiar with a, a guy named Claude Shannon? He's a legendary innovator at Bell Labs. He is the reason we can see one another on the screen right now. He invented a little thing called the bit. The, bit, the, the notion that you can encode information with ones and zeros that can be transmitted. Claude Shannon is our guy. I think he has the most referenced doctoral thesis of all time, okay? He was a absolute genius. And you know what he was known to do in the hallways of Bell Labs as they were inventing the transistor and the satellite and the laser? I kid you not, you can't make it up. He would juggle on his unicycle and he'd ride around the hallways juggling and people knew that's just Claude Shannon, you know? And a lot of people probably write it off, but you go, He's, again, he's wielding diversion as a tool. He knows 
when I'm stuck approaching the problem in one way, I need to give my brain time to kind of process all the stuff that I've been taking in. And so for us, one of the assignments we've started giving to the, I, I know D leaders that are on this uh, session are familiar with this, but we give the assignment to play. Go do something that you enjoy that engages you phys physically, but take a notebook with you and have the discipline to know in the back of your mind, you want to be leaving some of these, these things in your working memory. You want to be processing, but, pro but make progress by doing something different. And we joke, we joked with a group of Saudi executives recently who we gave this assignment to. This is probably the only Ivy League education where you've been told to go play video games or something, right? And they loved it and they came back blown away, right? Because we're so trained to when I got to solve the problem, I got to sit down and think harder and work harder rather than sometimes looking up, lifting up our heads and saying, what else can I do while I think about this? And it's no wonder that insights happen in the shower or, you know, uh, in, in, on the commute, right? I read something that said the bed, the bus, and the bathtub are the three, you know, there's a reason the bed, the bus, and the bathtub are often implicated in these stories of innovation. And, it's, and, and if you're aware of that, you can wield those as tactics to your advantage. Perry, you want to talk about this next one? Oh yeah, so um, the idea of pro productive procrastination, there is an amazing TED talk, I'll drop it in the chat, um, that um, uh, Adam Grant does and talks about this topic of actually, um, how do we say this? Like we, we think too many times, you know, I'm not solving a problem, I'm procrastinating, I'm wasting time, wasting time, but holding a problem in your active sort of working brain while you're procrastinating and maybe struggling with it a little bit is um, actually a great way to innovate and drive innovation and realize that's part of the process. If you think about those early stages, that's absolutely that incubation category. So next time you're procrastinating, think about it as actually more productive time. Am I holding still that problem in my head? Am I actually you know, sort of maybe consternating a bit on it in my procrastination? That's actually productive time that you'll actually move forward. And then I think, um, the, do you want to talk about the um, Bluma, the, the research? I'll drop the well, this is This is a hilarious example where actually Grant, Adam Grant talks about he's writing his book, Originals, and he, and he got to this, this notion of procrastination as a meaningful tactic. And he said, you know, he's an incredibly organized person. He said, I'm going to try it on for size. And while he was procrastinating, he put, it, he put the chapter in his drawer for a couple of weeks. And he was reminded of the research of uh, Zignarek, a Russian psychologist who demonstrated how our working memory continues. He said, I never would have thought of that if I hadn't chosen to procrastinate. This is kind of a meta realization that we love. And so we, again, tell students, if you're going to procrastinate, be deliberate about capturing write down other ways of solving the problem that, you, that you've got in the back of your mind. One important note, if you don't care about the outcome, procrastination is poisonous. If you really care about the outcome, procrastination is a meaningful and productive strategy. So that's not, to, that's not, that's not a universal um, uh, you know, blessing upon procrastination. There is such thing as bad procrastination. But it's useful to know that when we actually care about something, procrastination is a meaningful way that our, uh, that our, our subconscious can advance. And then the last tactic we want to talk about is taking this to the extreme, obviously, but is actually sleeping on a problem. There's a German psychologist, uh, Wagner Ulrich, I believe, I can post a link to it later maybe, but he, he gave sets of different sets of students different kinds of insight problems and analytical problems. And he gave them at different times of day and night. And one of the things that he discovered was for analytical problems, it didn't really matter when you gave them. But for insight related problems, for creative challenges, if you gave a, a subject the opportunity to sleep before solving the problem, they were two, I think over two times more likely to identify the insight that solved the problem. And this is a great, there's, there's a great story. Uh, one, of, one of the most prolific inventors of all time, Thomas Edison, over a thousand patents to his name, 
there's uh, there's a bit of folklore. Or it's it's written up in books, but you can never know with people like this and the things they do. But he had what he called his thinking chair. And the way the story goes, he would sit down in the thinking chair, he'd put two pie pans underneath both arms of the chair. And then he would hold a metal ball in each hand and he'd sit back to relax. And as he was dozing off, his hands would release and the balls would clatter into the pie pans and wake him up. And he would tell an attendant standing there what he was dreaming about. Because he so valued the power of the subconscious to get around some of the associative barriers that are predominant when your conscious brain is working on something. I love, he didn't call it his recliner. He didn't call it his napping chair. He called it his thinking chair. And what did he do in his thinking chair? He annoyingly woke himself up from just, I mean, I can't imagine how painful that had to be. I also read something recently that Salvador Dali did a similar thing. He would use a spoon in his hand and he would sit down and he would place a, a, a pan, a metal pan underneath the hand holding the spoon. And that's where a lot of the sur surrealistic inspiration came from is this kind of this dream state. So it's a, it's a good thing to be aware of. I have, I, I, I'll speak for myself personally. This is very practical. I keep beside my bedside, a stack of post-its. This is, you're like, of course you do. You work at the D school, of course, I'm not surprised. And a Sharpie. Mm -hmm. And I kid, and I've made an agreement with myself. As I, I was talking to a, uh, to a, uh, Perry and I were talking to an executive in Ireland last week. And I like what, because he, he said a lot of times when I'm surfing, ideas come to me. And he used this phrase, I love it. And I'll borrow it and I'll share it with you. He said, I've made a commitment to my subconscious to hold on to those ideas. And I love that phrase, commitment to my subconscious. And so what, I, uh, what I've done is I've said to myself, if an idea strikes, I don't care how sleepy I am, I'm gonna roll over and write it down. And I actually had the experience, I don't know if, and, and then I've got a, I have a whole process, a whole system, you know, as nerds do, where I keep this notebook in the back pocket of my jeans at all times. It's small enough that it fits the back pocket and it's thin enough that I don't take it out Unlike Costanza, by the way, full circle, Perry, can I get a witness? That was a good reference and a good joke. Unlike Costanza, it's thin enough that I can keep it in my back pocket, but then I'll transfer whatever ideas come up. And I actually have two from last night, interestingly enough. But what's funny is my funny story, this actually happened the other day. I was falling asleep. We we're working on this project. I was falling asleep and an idea came. And my first thought was, I know I tell people to write down their ideas, but I know I shouldn't be a hypocrite, but I'm just so tired. And then, but I'm like, no, I got to do it. I got to do it. I got to practice what I preach. And so I rolled over and, you know, it's totally dark. I don't even know if I'm writing on the post. If I, I scroll this thing and in the morning, I woke up and I thought of the idea and I thought, man, I can't believe I interrupted my sleep because I totally remember it. And then I picked up my notebook, what I wrote down was a completely different idea than what I thought I remember. <laughs> and it was this amazing experience of the idea that I have is really cool. And it's totally different from the idea that I thought was the idea I had. So it's, uh, you know, it's like uh, the, the men's hair club. I'm not only the president, I'm also a member. It's like this stuff works in my life, but it brings us to a very important uh, conclusion statement, which is the discipline of documentation. We often say, you've often heard us, if you've been at the D school for any amount of time, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Uh, our mentor, David Kelly, the founder of the D school, he told me an anecdote the other day. He was friends with the late Robin Williams. And he said, Robin Williams would carry a yellow legal pad with him everywhere. And he's writing down notes throughout the day. I read a, I read a biography of David Byrne, who was one of the founding members of the Talking Heads. And it, he was talking about how in his back pocket, he carried a dictaphone all the time because he said he'd hear something in the streets. He'd hear a beat or something and he'd want to record it or he'd want to sing a melody, right? But there's this rigorous attitude of, you know, just like you, you and we can think as professionals in maybe quote unquote non-creative fields, of course, Robin Williams is writing down ideas. He's got a set that night, you know, of course, David Byrne is taking clips. He's got, well, is our job to come up with new things is our job to frame that email 
to uh, give that piece of feedback, to, uh, to engage the customer, to secure a repeat purchase, to close the deal. Why, aren't, why don't we approach it with the same level of diligence and rigor? The idea of capturing all the ideas that come, we can sort them later. It's actually not that different. And so for that reason, I, I like to think we're all in the ideas business. Most of, us, most of us don't really know it. But if we're aware of it, we say, I'm in the ideas business too. And you know what my job is? It's to write down my ideas. I don't have to do all of them, but if I at least write them down, I'll give myself a fighting chance of discovering something worth doing. And it's, it's that simple, it's, it's, but I have found it's inc incredibly meaningful practice personally. And so I pass that on to you all. The commitment to your subconscious is a real thing. It is annoying. It is painful at times. I mean, my wife can tell you there the number of times I've gotten out of the shower, sopping wet. I'm like, ah, it happened again. <laughs> I'm writing down ideas, but I've made peace with it. I'm in the ideas business. You know what we do when we're in the ideas business? We write things down and we're focused on cultivating that input. 